Hi guys. Hey Rose, come sit. What's wrong? Something bothering you? Well, I was talking to this tulip and we really hit it off, but I found out that he's a Gemini, so it's just not gonna work out. What's wrong with being a Gemini? I'm also a Gemini, so don't you think dating another Gemini would be like dating yourself? You know, something like self-incompatibility? I'm pretty sure that self-incompatibility is not about horoscopes. Whatever, you know what I mean. No, Rose, you're way off. Fine, tell me what it means then. Well, self-incompatibility is basically a mechanism adapted by some plants to prevent inbreeding and promote outcrossing. There is a lot of diversity in the way plants become self-incompatible, but essentially they all have ways to either prevent contact with their own pollen or reject their own pollen. Hmm, interesting. This seems like a lot of trouble if a plant could just fertilize itself though, right? You're right. Flowering plants are sessile so they can't actively search for mates. Doing the sixth step and relying on pollinators doesn't seem evolutionary effective at first glance, but we now know that the traits which promote self-fertilization and inbreeding are often associated with a decline in genetic variability. For example, they might accumulate some harmful mutations or might be more vulnerable to diseases as a population. Wow, that's pretty remarkable. I only have heard of discriminatory mechanisms that accepted the same elements and rejected unlike elements, kind of like our immune system. So how exactly does a flower reject its own pollen? There are tons of ways. On a macroscopic level, plants with male and female flowers can simply mature at different times to avoid self-fertilization. Some flowering plants can also produce morphologically distinct flowers so that the position of their reproductive organs pose as a topological barrier. Another way that this is done is by discriminating pollen based on their genotype. In gametophytic systems, self-incompatibility is determined by the pollen's own haploid genome, so pollen tube growth is inhibited when the pollen S allele matches one of the S alleles expressed in the pistil. This mechanism occurs in poppies, tobacco, petunia, and even tomatoes and potatoes. The sporophytic system is even more selective because the self-incompatible behavior is determined by the diploid genotype of the pollen parent. If either one of the S alleles in the pollen correspond to one of the pistil S alleles, it will be rejected. But I still don't understand how the pistil can figure out if a pollen is compatible or not. I mean, they look the same, don't they? They do. But on a molecular level, plants have their own unique way to discriminate between different pollen. For example, the Brassicii family, such as cabbage, cauliflower, and broccoli, uses a receptor kinase signaling pathway in the pistil to reject incompatible pollen. Remember the S allele that I mentioned before? Molecular studies have actually identified self-incompatibility to be caused by several tightly linked genes in the S locus region of Brassicii. The two main ones are the S locus receptor kinase, or the SRK gene, and the S loci locus cysteine rich or SCR protein encoding gene. The SCR protein is located on the outer coat of the pollen and is a ligand for the S locus receptor kinase, which is located in the plasma membrane of stigma epidermal cells. Here you can see a stigma with receptors color coded based on the variant of their S locus blue for S1 and green for S3. When it encounters a pollen grain that expresses an S1 allele, it is considered a self-pollen. And when this pollen attaches and releases its SCR proteins on the surface of the stigma, it binds to the extracellular domain of SRK, activates the receptor, and causes a signal transduction pathway that leads to inhibition of the self-pollen. On the other side, you can see an S2 pollen, which is considered a non-self-pollen. This pollen will also deliver its SCR, but it doesn't bind or activate SRK receptors that are S1, S3. Therefore, there is no signal transduction pathway to inhibit this pollen, and it hydrates, germinates, and grows a pollen tube just like normal. Whoa, can you tell me more about this signaling pathway? Of course. When there isn't any pollen present, the SRK is kept inactive by binding to a small protein called thyroidoxin. In the meantime, exercise complexes in the stigma epidermal cells constantly secretes compatibility factors, 
which is what allows pollen tube growth to occur in normal conditions. When SCR is detected by the stigma cell wall, thyroidoxin is knocked off and SRK is now in its active form. Another protein called the M locus protein kinase, also known as MLPK, and an ether ubiquitin ligase called ARC1 becomes phosphorylated. And lastly, ARC1 ubiquitinates and degrades a component of the exercise called XO70A1. Compatibility factors are now no longer secreted and pollen is inhibited. It is so important that the activity of the SRK receptor is tightly regulated and only activated when in contact with the self-pollen, or else the plant will stay sterile. Do you think this can be done in reverse? Can we make a self-fertile plant become self-incompatible? Good question. This was actually done by researchers to study the function of the S locus genes and their role in self-incompatibility. The self-fertile Brassicii plant, Arabidopsis thaliana, was used because it lacks a functional S locus due to mutations in activating the SCR gene, the SRK gene, or both. So functional SRK-SCR gene pairs were isolated from its self-incompatible Brassicii relatives and inserted into Arabidopsis. This allowed Arabidopsis to discriminate between self and non-self pollen, further proving the important role of the S locus in self-incompatibility. All right, I think that's enough learning for today. Let's go outside and sunbathe. That sounds good. Let's go.